What is going on? It is Alex coming back at you with another video and today we are finally doing our seven round of mock draft for the 2024 NFL draft. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. It always helps out. We just breached 11k so we're on the way to 15. Let's try to do it ASAP. Let's get on the hype train and this is going to be divided by division because it's awesome that do that way and it takes a lot of time to do this, so please, again, hit that thumbs up. It helps out the algorithm. Feel free to comment your thoughts below. There was only one trade allowed in this, and that's the Vikings trade up. I traded with the Los Angeles Chargers because that's going to happen way later. So, obviously, might as well talk about it now. That's also why I did not do any other trades in this at all. Just want to do the one that was pretty much guaranteed. So, let's get right into this. Again, this is broken down by division, starting out with the AFC North because I'm a Steelers fan and I get to be able to run the show here, right? So starting out with the Steelers. Yes, this is going to be the format that it is like. We started out and this is not by a mock draft simulator. This is continuous. Every single one. I did all of these picks, all 257 of them. So it's not like I can do 80 Mitchell for multiple teams. This is for every single team. Um, so A.D. Mitchell was the guy who ended up falling at number 20. There were no right tackles that I thought were available that were worth it. Amarius Mims, we'll talk about it in a second, was gone. So without really a true number two wide receiver on our team, I was like, hell, let's try it out. Let's get it and see what tackles might be there. One of the tackles that I'm very low on is Kingsley Suamataia, but that is him as a left tackle. His reps at right tackle are still really solid. He looks more comfortable as a right tackle than as a left. So I think he can actually really work on the Steelers, especially with Arthur Smith. And that mobility is going to be a huge asset early on. I think that's a big win for us. Cedric Van Pran was there for us at 84. We get that center plug right away. Huge win there. Kalen Carson is honestly super smart. I have very similar strengths and weaknesses to what I had with Joey Porter Jr. last year. Just a little bit less athletic because he was, you know, technically beat speed-wise by Keon Coleman, which he didn't really test out the best. But his play speed is perfectly fine. I think he's very efficient with his steps. I think he'd be a great corner two for us or corner three as we develop Dante Jackson into the role. But Kalen King, he was there at 119. And I just felt like we needed to take a swing on him. He's someone who was a first round corner up until mid year this year, and he performed really, really well with Joey Porter Jr. He also can work as a slot. He can also work as a safety. That versatility, you're going to find a role for him. And again, you have that comfortability with Joey Porter Jr. there on the team. Jalen Ford at 178, getting some really good value there at linebacker and Jalen Sheridan at a mom myth, getting that nice high quality running back, very high yards per carry. And, uh, you know, one of those, we always drafted some player out of some gnome name school, but I'm going to try to keep it a little bit shorter for the rest of the teams because I had to break that down a little bit more for us. But the Ravens, uh, this is what y'all got over the seven rounds, starting out with Tyler Guyton. Got to get that protection there at right tackle. Also give a nice little middle finger to the team that you might be playing in the Super Bowl. If you make it to the Super Bowl in the 49ers uh, upgrade over Daniel Fai Lele. That's just a big win right there. TJ Tampa, that secondary needs help, and I'm trying to blend realism in here. Not a huge fan of TJ Tampa myself, but has a great frame. I think he actually worked really well with the mentorship of Marlon Humphrey. Jermaine Burton is essentially that OBJ replacement, so you know that role is certainly still open, in my opinion. And then I essentially went BPA for the rest of these picks. Austin Booker slipped. Someone who is a little bit on the lighter side, didn't test out as well as he should have, but you know he was somebody who people started considering a second-round pick after the Senior Bowl. Until he tested, not so great at the combine. It happens. Uh, Jordan Travis was there at pick 165. Someone who has some extremely high-level play, and the backup quarterbacks on this team are not really good at all. And with his mobility, definitely a way to incorporate him into the game, no doubt. And he still has that high-level quarterback play. Would love for him to learn from Lamar. Dylan Laube, you know, just a really solid running back to add into that rotation that they have. There's a lot of dudes on that roster, but again, I wanted to go BPA. There wasn't really many players that had a better resume than Dylan Laube, who is a very, very talented back. Delmar Glaze and Marcellus Dial, both of those guys are going to be depth players, but from Maryland, they're comfortable with them. They probably already know how to use them best in their system. Delmar Glaze does actually have a little bit more upside than what I uh, probably just gave him a little credit for. And Marcellus Dial, he has a very funny hairdo at the combine. It essentially looked like a parachute attached to his head. 
that was just the guy. That's how I remember him so well. But, you know, he had five interceptions over the past year. Marcellus Dial could be a guy to steal later on in the draft. Now we got the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, Amarius Mims was their pick. You know, also another way to middle finger the Pittsburgh Steelers. But right tackle was a big need. The right tackle wasn't really available. I uh, got to go and replace our loss in DJ Reader with Tavondre Sweat. Really good selection there. Malachi Corley to be that slot guy who also, you think about it, could certainly help out in returns and after the catch with these hip drop tackles like that after the catch ability is going to be very, very much valued. Marshawn Lloyd, also another player who is 220 pounds. He's an absolute freak. If he didn't fumble, I would have him arguably as RB1. Just saying. Then you got Javon Baker, super underrated receiver in this class. I just don't have an official grade on him because my sources for all 22 don't have UCF tape. I'm not going to make uh, opinions on wide receivers that I don't have. I haven't seen all 22 tape on, but the tape I have seen is awesome. Uh, he's a really fun player to watch, and he actually, this receiving core needs a bit of help, in my opinion. Adefon Ulupo show was there at pick 149, just went BPA at that point. Injuries have been the only reason why he is not going higher, but it is what it is. Nathaniel Watson tested out well as well. Uh, Bray McGregor, a solid edge rusher depth. Nathan Thomas, I love Louisiana offensive lineman, so show some love there. And then Austin McNamara. Only like, I started just trying to filter in some kickers and punters in here. They're just going to be guys who get six round or later. Maybe some of these guys end up moving up higher in the draft, but don't take it too seriously. I mean, the punters and kickers, I'm trying my best to at least add them in. Got to meet Austin McNamara it, uh, in Mobile, though. He's actually quite a chill dude. So Cleveland Browns, not too many picks, but Peyton Wilson going to go BPA. I'm willing to take the injury risk for the actual play value that he brings to the table. Jarvis Brownlee, someone who's one of my favorite corners, feel free to go check out that video. But super high ceiling player, he's a dog. Uh, you know, he ended up playing on a hurt foot and still played very, very well at the end of the season. Cornelius Johnson slipped to him at 156, again, BPA at a position of high value, and he's coming off a really, really solid post uh, postseason career, uh, postseason, I don't know, like pre-draft combine stuff. How do we describe that? I don't even know. So basically, after the season, he's had a very good offseason before the combine. There, the Shrine Bowl did a great job. Cody Schrader, somebody very similar to Dylan Laube, like great personality. So he's going to have a great motor, going to be very, like, whether he's on the practice squad or not, the fact that he is around other players, like that motor is a bit contagious. I like that a lot. Johnny Dixon has had some pretty damn good games there for Penn State. So good depth player right there. The Bears, go Caleb Williams, Romo Dunze, uh, you know, standard one, two. And then you got Kalen Bullock because Bayard's there, but we all know Bayard's not the future. And last time they brought in a safety on a short-term contract, they ended up drafting ja uh, Jaquan Brisker. So I feel like they might still be in the market for a safety, especially if a really talented one, as in my safety one, slips to pick 75. Then we got Gabriel Murphy there at pick 122 because we need to get a little bit extra edge competition in there. You know, at pick nine, you technically could go after somebody, but you do really run the risk of, you know, I mean, I think this team works really damn well as it is with the edge rushing crew that they have because the defense overall is great. I'd rather ensure the offense is success, especially with a new signal caller, then overvalue uh, the minute increases in defensive talent. So Gabriel Murphy is actually a really talented player. I think that he's going to be a big plus for y'all. Then we got the Green Bay Packers. So you got Cooper DeGene, round one. Again, kind of a stereotypical pick, but super duper versatile. Love that for him. Uh, I do see a little bit of room for improvement on the interior of the offensive line. Christian Haynes has had taken reps at both center and guard. So when Myers wants to move on, it's a great way to do that. Cole Bishop was next, adding him next to Xavier McKinney. I love Cole Bishop. Ended up testing out better than what we ever expected. You know, this is one of my dream fits for him. So I'm very excited that, be, that he was there for us at pick 58. Then I got a couple of linebackers with Christian Boyd in between, but we'll talk about Christian Boyd after. Jeremiah Trotter and Michael Barrett. Linebacker is a big issue on this squad. Uh, you'll see that the linebackers were gone by pick 41, hence why I went offensive line. But Christian Boyd gets some extra beef on that interior, and he's somebody who 
popped off. You're obviously getting somebody that's relatively close to where you're at as well. So he's used to playing in the outdoor environment. So that's going to be great for the long run. At least, you know, he's somebody who can fit well in the climate, but he popped off at the Shrine Bowl as well. And Christian Boyd, Isaiah Adams was next as well as Jalen Sundle. Those guys are going to be depth offensive line pieces. Uh, Isaiah Adams, super versatile, but really sucked as a right tackle. Probably going to be someone who's a flexible tackle guard, which also kind of fits with what the Packers like to do. Uh, Sundell, you know, just a talented uh, offensive tackle that it will probably be a practice squad guy, but, you know, we all have a lot of picks and not many holes to fill. Austin Reed, you know, Western Kentucky quarterback. He's somebody who has actually operated an air raid system pretty damn well. I think that he might be a nice little selection there at 219. ZTF and Bub Memes were those final two picks. Bub actually didn't test out too poorly there at the combine, but didn't really see enough from him to garner enough attention on my end. And then ZTF, he's a DPR. He's a guy to just add into that rotation. When you do have some guys who aren't exactly ready or a little bit more on the raw or old side, uh, it's nice to have a little extra infusion of youth. You got the Detroit Lions here going Kool-Aid McKinstry to start out. They need to have a little bit more juice in that secondary. You got Carlton Davis. Awesome. But Emmanuel Mosley's there on a one-year deal. It's like, eh. I mean, Cam Sutton's gone, so you do still need corner. Uh, Jonah Ellis, you drafted his father, Luther Ellis, so it's kind of cool to bring him back. He's going to be a DPR, but based on the designated pass rusher, uh, but based on the roster that you do have, I think that you have a little flexibility to bring on somebody who, you know, he did have a little bit more of an issue last year in terms of production because of that shoulder. That's going to be better. He's going to end up, I hope, improving on his football IQ. Um, the guy does not know how to track, especially during rundowns. Um, you know, he just doesn't know where the ball is. But, you know, that's my only real issue with him. He has a great motor. It's just, again, that processing that needs to improve. Then we got Bo Lemmer. I love Bo Lemmer to death. Y'all know this. He's a top 64 player for me. You have Frank Ragnow, who could eventually retire because of all the uh, shenanigans that are going on in his life, but, you know, might end up replacing him. Also might go for a guard role, which is going to be what he does right away. And also is where he is best at. Makes sense. Then he got Quantez Stiggers. Um, shout out to PFF for not having him in the mock draft simulator. So me still having to put different placeholder players. I don't know why we can't do that nowadays, but you know, shout out to PFF for not doing their job right. Uh, then you got Miles Harden, another defensive back. So again, I really wanted to hammer on the defensive backs here. Miles Harden's super injury prone. You're just going BPA at that point. Quantas Stiggers is a fun player to have. But again, you're you're really testing the waters with these guys. Like you're getting great value because I think Stiggers could end up being, you know, he was, I think, the CFL defensive player of the year. Uh, he could end up being someone who actually does start with Kool-Aid McKinstry there, but you got Miles Harden, who is essentially a third round value in terms of his talent, but the injuries have just dropped him exponentially. Uh, so we're just going BPA at this point for this team. Uh, Trey Knox was there at 205. He's someone who runs crisp routes and he essentially is a slot wide receiver. So I got him and Ladatric Griffin to essentially add a little bit more excitement to the depth of the receiving core. Most of these guys probably won't make it, but my real goal was to add a true corner one and at least get some better depth, especially since Cam Sutton's gone, and then also address that offensive line spot and maybe get some upside at edge. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, Vikings, this was the one trade of the draft. Remember that. Uh, traded up to five and got JJ McCarthy. I didn't overcomplicate it. It was just the two picks for the one. Uh, then we got Christian Mahogany. I think the guard spots, uh, I'm forgetting who it is at your left guard spot. He's kind of butt cheeks. But you know, now you got Christian Mahogany, who's a really talented player. You'll have to kick him over or Ed Ingram over to left guard. So, you know, you'll figure that out. But that was really good value for Mahogany. I think he could certainly be a top 100 pick. Jacob Cowing, again, another BPA selection. You're getting, you know, without having KJ Osborne on your team, I think this is a great way to bring a little bit more excitement there. He's a little bit on the smaller side, but someone who is a top 40 player for me for quite a while as a very minimum top 50 he just didn't end up showing out the way I really wanted him to at the Senior Bowl. Uh, Logan Lee getting some extra beef on the interior from Iowa. Never a bad idea. Dallin Holker, the dude who ended up catching two balls during uh, the gauntlet drill. Love that. Two balls at once because he forgot that there was the last ball coming. 
Uh, he's a really talented depth tight end for you. He ended up uh, slipping because of his testing numbers. Jace McClellan's just a solid contact balance back. People will hate on him for absolutely no reason. The dude's just not flashy, but uh, should be there at pick 177. Gabe Hall, he had some really good reps there at the Senior Bowl as well. Like to see that. And then Dominique, Wash uh, Dominique Hampton, excuse me, out of Washington, ended up slipping to the end of the seventh round, which it's always good to be able to get some good safety depth on the team, given that, you know, the safeties that we have on roster not necessarily the most reliable or getting old. So not going to be there within a year or two. Then we got the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, we're going to be going Brian Thomas to start out. Love that. Ended up slipping with Chop Robinson. If you end up actually like, please, before you start being an ass and try to go in at me for Chop slipping to 48, there's a very strong chance he might not even be a second round pick. Hate to say it, but this is one of those guys where I'm not going to be surprised on draft night if he ends up going at pick 70. Like, he is a DPR at art, designated pass rusher. He cannot play the run, doesn't play the run well at all. He has extremely high ceiling in terms of a pass rusher, but he has crap balance, and he has all right ankle flexion, but he has a beautiful first step. And he kind of has the same amount of moves as he did the year before, which shows no progression in the tactics of his work. I have my issues with Chop, but he is here at 48, and this is a team that you just don't, you don't have Caleb on chase on anymore. This is a great guy to sit and develop behind Josh Allen. It's a great move because you can afford that upside because then you get Kyrie Jackson at pick 96 to add a little bit extra physicality to that corner core, 6'4", 200 pounds to be exact. A uh, really good build. Then we also get Jerry and Jones right there in the Florida area to add some nice versatility in the slot as well as at safety. Then we got Dwayne Carter also slipping. Great ability to bull rush from the zero tech. I love that for him. And then you got Anaya Smith, who's kind of a weapon there, especially with the new kickoff rules. You know, certainly going to add a little bit extra value to him. Kamani Vidal, uh, just a talented Troy running back. And then you got Tory Taylor, you know, one of those top punters that I talked about. Probably will end up going earlier, but... Again, um, I'm no expert on where special teamers go. I'd eventually, you know, we'll we'll figure that out in time because, I mean, I never did it before. And God only knows. Essentially, you're just shooting in the dark to see who's going to select them. I mean, there's fourth-round players like, I think Stout was a fourth-round player for the Baltimore Ravens. But, you know, it, we'll, we'll see what happens. Tory Taylor might be a fourth round pick, which would be a surprise to me, but I'm not having, I don't have the balls. Let's just say to do that at the moment, uh, pick or pick numbers, uh, spot number, whatever it is for the Indianapolis Colts, the Indianapolis Colts for the seven round mock draft started out with Jared verse. So you had seven dudes or excuse me, four dudes with seven pressures last year. Just kidding. Seven sacks. So, uh, four dudes, seven sacks or more. That's great. But you still do not have an edge one. And you know Ballard loves his edge ones. He loves investing in the defensive line. He spent first for DeForest Buckner, Quiddy Pay. Like he values that defensive line. And you still don't have an edge one coming, especially with Quiddy Pay coming up on his fifth year contract. So, or fifth year extension. Jared versus there. I'm taking him in a heartbeat. This guy could definitely revamp and also help out that secondary. There wasn't anybody there from those top two corners. I don't think there's a reason to be forcing another defensive back pick because I got Cam Hart. Now, it's a little bit early for me for Cam Hart, but he is local to the area. He has a great physical build. I think he'd fit a little bit more with what Ballard wants than what I personally want. Then you got Tyler Newbin. You need safety help pretty desperately. Tyler Newbin slipped there because of his 4640 and because, you know, he does have some inefficiencies in his game. I think realistically he actually might be there and that's going to be a great choice for y'all. Then we got Isaac Garendo at pick 117. Uh he obviously lit up the combine 433 speed at like 220 pounds. The dude's a freak show. Just worth taking a shot on behind Jonathan Taylor and seeing what develops there. Then we got Matt Goncalves out of Pittsburgh. Just a versatile offensive line piece. Good depth right there. Nehemiah Pritchett honestly was an absolute steal. I love him to death. Great player. And, you know, just again, for pick 191, he has not too many inefficiencies that I would be like, I'd run that to the podium. I'd be happy with that probably at 151 as well. And then at 234, got some extra defensive back depth in Kitan Oladapo. 
who was there at the Senior Bowl. So you at least know that he is a talented player. Now we got the Texans starting out with Ricky Pearsall. Going to get somebody to add in with Nico Collins as well as Tank Dell for the future. Love Michael Holm. Defense interior is still a position I want to address. And, you know, at 290 to 300 pounds, running the four sevens, having 33 and a half inch arms, like, He's done such a great job of the offseason coming from 280 pounds to still being a physical freak it's close to 300. I'm a big fan of his. I'm a believer in his as well. Then we got Theo Johnson to be behind Dalton Schultz. I know you have a couple other tight ends in there, Brevin Jordan, as well as Quatoriano, but Theo Johnson to me brings that Penn State run blocking ability and after the catch ability as well. And obviously he tested out very, very well. 993 RAS score worth taking a shot on at 86. Then we got DTD the Texas Tech safety who's getting a ton of love. Some people have him as high as top 50. Well worth the selection right there. Javon Solomon, again, I essentially just wanted to go BPA as much as I could. You know, getting a talented edge rusher out of Troy who just tested out a little bit worse than expected. Ladarius Henderson, a versatile offensive lineman from Michigan, formerly Arizona State. You got Marcus Harris, who is going to be a depth offensive lineman. And then Will Reichard, because why not add some competition at the kicking room for essentially dirt cheap. And Reichard was a pretty solid kicker for Alabama. Got to meet him there in Mobile as well. Now we got the Titans. Uh, we got them start out with Joe Alt. That's a novel pick, right? Uh, but he's a great player. Edron Cooper was the next one. The linebacking core is so much worse than I expected. The more I broke down the roster, I was like, oh, like, ugh. Uh, it was not good. So Edron Cooper, instant upgrade. I think that technically Junior Colson's better, but you'll see at the end of the video, um, there's a team that sniped him at pick 37. So, you know, did not have that option. It was pretty much Edron Cooper or Peyton Wilson. And I preferred to go after the player with a little bit more upside and a little bit less injury history. So Edron Cooper was a great asset there. Then snuck in Mo Kamara somehow. I do think this edge rushing crew needs a bit more depth. And Mo Kamara brings it. Uh, love that to death. He's going to be a day one impact as a DPR. And he's actually not too shabby as a run defender. Then you got Sion Vaki slipping to us at 146. You know, he is a little bit on the smaller side in terms of stature, but he is someone who has a great motor and he actually could play some running back. Some people think he might be even worth more as a running back. So it'd be quite intriguing to see his role there in Tennessee. Then you got Luke McCaffrey slipping at 182. Some people love Luke McCaffrey to death. So why not add a little bit and take a shot on someone who's really talented there in the sixth? Then we got Caden Wallace, MJ Devonshire, and Andrew Rame there in the seventh round, essentially getting some depth players, especially on the O-line, because we need help in the O-line. Now we're going to go to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, you got J.C. Latham to start out, especially with Ram Chicks news. I mean, the dude's possibly, if not probably, not going to play. But there were no left tackles on the board. Well, there was. I just didn't really think that they are going to give up on Trevor Penning over, like, going out, going after like the replacement for Ryan Ramship with all of this stuff that he's going through. Also, JC Latham is viewed by a lot of people as a very, very talented player who just needs a little bit more technical work. If Ryan Ramchick really is dealing with a ton of injuries, that's something where Ryan could be recovering and still coaching up the successor there. Uh, JC Latham, the talented player, could also switch over to left tackle if need be. Uh, then you got Darius Robinson, who's going to be, you know, that physical big freak that you're looking for to be the successor for Cam Jordan. Then we go all the way to the fifth round. I got Joe Milton here. I need something to get excited about with that quarterbacking core. Joe Milton, I'm not giving up hope. I'm not. I'm, I might be stupid for that. I might be arrogant. I'm not, I'm not losing hope on him. And that's probably one of the reasons I haven't dropped a quarterback video is just because, I mean, the amount of shit and the toxicity of the whole entire community right now over these quarterbacks just doesn't make it worth it over the other positions. I think you guys would still get a lot of value from hearing about that. I actually enjoy talking about with y'all. Uh, but Joe Milton's going to bring a bit more upside there. Cade Stover has some good blocking and some development that he's had. Also a former edge rusher too, which is cool. Then you got Tyler Davis to pair back up with Brian Breezy. Fun to have that in there. Uh, Rosemey Jack Saint is just a talented wide receiver from Georgia who has some good size to him. It was there at the senior bowl as well. But we need to add some depth to the receiving core. Don't really have it right now. Then you got Garrett Greenfield and Tylen Grable. As you can tell, I am focusing pretty heavily on the offensive line because I don't believe in the offensive line. And then Daquan Hardy, a nice depth piece there out of Penn State. Buccaneers, you got JPJ starting out to be a center or a guard, depending on what Sue Opeta wants to do. You know, you're just essentially going after what you think is best. Then we got Braylon Trice, essentially just slipping just because of the fact that 
you know, hate to say it, but he randomly slipped 30 pounds. <laughs> and uh, I'm still giving him a chance because 80 pressures is not easy to replicate. As you can tell, nobody even got to 70 except Liatu Latu. That's kind of a big feat. So he had 10 pressures more than everybody else, at least in the Pac-12. If not, I think the entire country. Uh, then you got Mikey Sainer still just getting a guy who's going to be an energy piece for that locker room. Also, that's a sick image of him. So I always wanted to put that up there. But Mikey Sainer still is going to be someone who's a great locker room presence and could end up being a safety, could end up being a boundary corner, could end up being a slot corner. That's a good versatility to have, but the thing is he's going to be an asset in the locker room, and that also might end up being worth even more than his play on the field. Then you got Jonathan Brooks. Running back slipped a bit a bit in these, but you know, running back just isn't a very valuable position. There's not amazing running backs in this class. I think it is underrated, but you know, I think that th we've seen very many running back classes that are superior. Then we got Mar uh, Maurice Leo Maurice. Lou Fow out of Notre Dame, just getting some good depth at linebacker there. Dylan Johnson, another running back because this team needs some help at running back. Um, and then essentially I was just going after BPA and then Yabi Oki Anoma to add some depth there as well. So you're getting some good value. Then you got the Atlanta Falcons starting out with Dallas Turner. Oh my God. And it's so like people are for some reason not vibing with Dallas Turner. I don't know what's up with y'all. I'm, I hope you're okay, but don't know what's up with y'all. Uh, Dallas Turner's a great player. Don't hate on him. There's no reason to. Max Belton was there in the second. I'm taking him in a heartbeat. This dude's an absolute animal. Well-deserving, honestly, of a day one pick. But we end up sniping him here in day two. Spencer Rattler was there on uh, round number three. So I wanted to be able to develop him under Kirk Cousins because I think his biggest issue is not anything to do on the field. It's something to do in his head. And that's kind of that leadership slash immaturity, which has gotten better. I didn't really notice it that much, which is great. But why not put him in the best possible spot, which is learning from Kirk Cousins. Then you got Brandon Rice, who I have a ton of faith in. I mean, this dude's going to end up being possibly top 50 on my board. You know, you watch, he only had something like sub 50 receptions last year. I think it was 42. He's on all of Caleb Williams highlight reels because he's the one creating a lot of space as well. So no, no disrespect to Caleb, obviously, but um, he was doing a lot of work getting open too. So I got to give shout out to him for that. He's a great player and this team needs something more than the one year contracts that are still there. So like Rondell Moore, like he's not going to be here in a couple of years. You need to have somebody there for the long run. Brendan Rice can be a great asset. Cam Kitchens going BPA right there. Might as well see if he can end up pairing up with Jesse Bates and seeing how Jesse Bates can mentor the guy who should have been a first round pick. Eric all getting some good depth there from Iowa. I actually like his route running quite a bit. Jason Obwegby, he's going to be someone who adds that 290 frame that essentially is going to be that depth defensive line piece. And then you got Steel Chambers who He's a bit light, but fun to add into that rotation nonetheless, and a badass name nonetheless. Pick number, just kidding, man. I'm so used to mock drafts at this point. Carolina Panthers, uh, they start out their mock draft by going Ennis Rakestraw Jr. Wait, no wide receiver? If you actually look at the receiving core, for this year specifically as well, you realize that there's a lot bigger deficiencies than the wide receiving core. And there wasn't really anybody there. So when you look at the wide receivers that were there, you got essentially De like you got Deontay Johnson that I think would play a very similar role to Lad McConkey on this team. You got Jonathan Mingo. By the way, there was no Keon Coleman available. There was no Xavier Leggett available. Just keep that in mind as well. So I was like, hell, let's look at that corner core. You got Dane Jackson there. I'm fine with Dane Jackson, but I know I can get a massive upgrade in Ennis Rakeshaw Jr., who I have as a top 20 player on my board. Then I got Zach Frazier there, coming off a broken leg. I know, Austin Corbett's scheduled to be the center, but he has a great wrestling background. At least it can help out in the run game in the short run, and as he gets more comfortable with himself, can end up being a nice polished center in the long run that could help out Bryce. Then you got Johnny Wilson at pick 65. This is someone who can take a year to develop and learn from somebody who has really good hands, not Deontay Johnson, <laughs> but you could have him learn from Adam Thielen, who's very, very reliable. And Johnny Wilson, I have full faith in him as a wide receiver, but you can use him as a tight end if you want. That's why I'm leaving him labeled as a weapon, 6'6", 231, and he runs a better three cone in short shuttle, if I'm not mistaken, than Ricky Pearsall, who I really, really like. So 
keep that in mind. It's very hard to find someone who is built like Johnny Wilson. Would love to see him be able to flourish there in Carolina. Then we got Tommy Eichenberg. You know, Tommy Eichenberg and Tevin Wallace might as well batch them together um, in the fourth and the fifth round. You know, linebacker, linebacking core with Jeremy Chin as well as, um, why am I slipping up? Jeremy Chin as well as, who's the linebacker? No, Alex, he went to the commanders. Uh, Frankie Luvu. Like, it sucks to lose him. Sucks to lose him. And I know that we have, like, some contingency plans in place. That's fine. But I think some longer-term options, like a developmental piece like Tevin Wallace, who is extremely athletic. And you got Tommy Eichenberg, who's a little bit more of that high-floor guy. These are just dudes you need to have on your roster. So, uh, well, it's worth bringing them in. And then Tanner Bordellini might end up being better than Zach Frazier, hot take, but has played all five positions of the offensive line. That's an invaluable depth piece that allows you to essentially have security on five positions with one player. I love that. Then we got Jarius Monroe, a nice depth piece there out of Tulane in the seventh. Now, New England Patriots, they go Jaden Daniels to start out and then Lad McConkey. So I, I think I've lied. Did I say, oh, wait, no, I said Lad McConkey was there for the Panthers. But uh, you got Jaden Daniels. Jaden's awesome. You know, I think that he is certainly going to have some struggles with the lack of firepower for the Patriots. Yeah, you lack the height when you bring in Lad McConkey. You have a ton of dudes who are not necessarily the biggest guys on planet Earth. But, you know, you got to make do with what you got to do. Uh, you're going to get a great player there in Lab and you're solving that left tackle spot with someone who needs a bit more coaching, a little bit more development, but still can probably hold his own there in Patrick Paul. Um, edge rusher needed some depth. Honestly, you look at the depth, it's not that great. Xavier Thomas was that guy who I thought was a, an absolute steal at pick 103. Then you got Braylon Allen, a 20-year-old kid who is an absolute freight train there at 137. Why not? And then Taj Washington. Not helping out with the size, but, you know, still a great player. You got Tip Ryman. That dude is a beast. Obviously, you hear about. I think he was the, no, he wasn't the dude with the cows. That was Cade Stover. Uh, Tip Ryman, I forget what was making him so damn special, but uh, he was a fun guy to watch there at the Combine. And then Miles Murphy, a nice depth piece out of UNC. New York Jets going Tali Fuwaga to start out. Now, this is something I want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, Tali Fuwaga is a awesome don't try to shit on tali fuaga i mean the people who are trying to say that he's going to be a bust come on i mean at the very minimum he'll end up being an elite tier guard and i still think he could play an elite tier tackle but like even if you were pessimistic about him as a tackle he could play a really good guard spot so um saying that he will be a bust seems to be very 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 ignorant i'm not gonna use the term arrogant but we'll use the term ignorant um, losing a little bit of respect for people who actually don't believe in Tali Fuaga. But my thought process is this. Of course, you end up seeing that you get Troy Franklin there on the third round. You're like, okay, you know, I'm fine with that because you get a good weapon there. But the logic at pick 10 is this. You know that one of your tackles is going down. Minimum, if not two. And maybe you can kick AVT there. Sure. But you're leaving one of your positions, if not two, wide open to being absolutely abused by NFL defenses. Aaron Rodgers is not young enough to be able to handle that level of abuse. You need to make sure that you have as much risk management in place as possible. Max Mitchell is not someone you want starting in the playoffs. Hate to say it. You don't want him starting against all pro defensive ends. Not going to be the best outcome, right? If you want to win a Super Bowl, which should be the goal of the NFL, is to actually win the championship, then you need to have risk management in place. Tali Fuaga, he will be able to play left and right tackle. He actually looked pretty damn comfortable at both. And he can play interior offensive line. That's where he'll play at first. He'll play right guard as he's being trained by Tyron Smith as well as Morgan Moses. Then one of them goes down. Maybe AVT is more comfortable. And then you can kick the next guard up for AVT's spot. Or you can kick Tali to one of those spots as well. That is making sure that you have five competent starters on your team at all times. You need that. Hate to say it. You need it if you want a chance to win. Uh, then you got Troy Franklin, which, you know, obviously he slipped there. Some people are going to say no, but his disrespect for the gauntlet drill and his lack of trust in himself on the move uh, definitely was apparent. And I think the talent on the field is great, but looking into the psyche of him, he looked very, very uncomfortable. And when you're in high pressure situations and you crack, not necessarily the best thing in the world. Uh, safety also was a little bit of a vacancy. Jaden Hicks was great value at that point. Also had a little bit of dynamicism there in Jamari Thrash. 
there in the fourth round. I love that. Getting some good depth with a high ceiling player in Devin Leary to back up Aaron Rodgers. Always a great plus since Zach Wilson. Not going to be the guy who they keep on the roster for the long run. Then you got Kendall Milton and Justin Rodgers to end off. Two really nice depth pieces to add that probably won't actually actualize to anything. Now we go to the Miami Dolphins. They start out with Grandma Barton. You know, Grant Barton's awesome. Uh, he's super versatile, super flexible. I have him a little bit more around my 40 range, but that versatility will push him up other teams' boards. Chris Jenkins is also next after losing Christian Wilkins. It makes a ton of sense to want to plug the middle. And Chris Jenkins, I think, is a very, very competent interior defensive lineman. Javon Foster is a developmental offensive tackle that you'll be developing for one year or, well, very similar to what I just talked about with Tali Fuaga, will end up playing uh, this year at left tackle because Armstead is unreliable. Then you got Jordan Jefferson, another guy to add with Chris Jenkins, a little bit of juice there in the middle. Miles Cole, who is a freaky, like 36 to 37 inch arm edge rusher out of Texas Tech. Would love to see the upside there. And then Brevin Spam Ford, who I am kind of lost all hope on, but pick 241. He's 6'6", 260 pounds, and has some tape of him running routes almost like a wide receiver. So you're kind of holding on to hope there. Now we go to the Buffalo Bills. Lots of picks here. Xavier Leggett starts out the draft. Love that for him. Braden Fiske, you know, he's another really talented interior defensive lineman, and this team needs interior defensive line help. Hate to say it, it's true. And his medicals certainly worry me, but I am also thinking if I'm sitting there as the Bills, one of the things I do not want is letting Braden Fiske go all the way to the Niners, who could definitely use him, which um, I think that we're going to be talking about the Niners division next. Trying to remember which ones I've already done because I've been working on this now for eight hours. Now we got the Tyron Hopper. Tyron Hopper is an elite pass rushing linebacker, but he also is pretty solid in coverage. Very athletic, uh, worth taking a shot on at 128. Elijah Jones, used to that area at BC. He's used to that climate. He's a little bit on the thinner side, but he is not really proven to be much of a liability. He's actually a really talented corner. Love that for him. James Williams, also a versatile defensive backslash linebacker. I love James Williams, so... Uh, got to send them to the Bills where they can use some extra DB support. Then I got a couple O linemen. I'll just go through JV and Cohen and Julian Pearl right now, and then we'll go back to Cedric Johnson. Uh, Julian Pearl, he was somebody who was arguably a third round pick at the start of this year. Ended up completely crumbling, hoping to get him back to 2022 form, hence why he's a sixth round pick. And then JV and Cohen, he's just a really solid build. He has a those certain high level reps that make you think he could actually start in the NFL, but it's too inconsistent. That's why he's going to be a fifth round pick. Cedric Johnson just wasn't that talented on the field. He actually took a drop in terms of his overall production this year, uh, in terms of like actual efficiency, uh, not looking at the statistics wise, but if you actually watch him play the, he just was not the same player, but tested out very, very well. Love to see the potential there with him. Keaton Slovis, another quarterback that I have a ton of faith in, just needs to stay healthy. Keith Randolph, good depth and interior defensive lineman. Then got a shout out to Ryan Flournoy, who tested out pretty damn well there at the Combine. Now we go to the Washington Commanders. Starting out with Drake May over Jaden Daniels. It wouldn't really make that drastic of a difference in the mock draft. We could just swap the QBs if you are that grouchy. I assume you are not. Uh, you got Marshawn Nealon there, fan of the show, friend of the show. He actually came on for an interview earlier this week, so feel free to check that out. You got Karan Amagaji. I love Karan. I think he'd actually start at left tackle, but you actually have a little bit of a buffer there for the short term. Actually, have Christian Jones starting at right tackle, though, so you actually got your two future starting tackles um, at pick 40 and 67, respectively. Christian Jones, a very talented tackle, nonetheless. Adiza Isaac was there at pick 78. I had to go get him. My Probably my biggest regret this draft was not drafting corner earlier, but we did actually end up lucky into Josh Newton, who we'll talk about in a second. Then I got uh, Drake Mays, own wide receiver there in Tez Walker. People complain about the receiving core. Whether I agree with that or not, doesn't really matter. If Tez is there at 100, it's cool to get that synergy. Then you got Zach Zenter, who is going to come back from his leg break and going to be an awesome offensive lineman, offensive guard for y'all. Uh, great run support as well. Then we got Josh Newton. Uh, I was you know kind of bummed out that I didn't draft a corner before 152, but I was pretty damn lucky to get Josh Newton there, who could certainly be a contributor right away. And then Jalen Simpson's not a bad safety at all to get at one, uh, pick number 222. So getting potential impact players right away is a huge plus, and addressing your biggest areas of need, in my opinion, also a big plus. And then we get the Cowboys. So this got piss people off. I already know it, and I love y'all. Just keep that in mind. Uh, Keon Coleman's going to be the first-round pick. I think you might trade back and get him, but 
Keon Coleman is the cousin of CeeDee Lamb. You're lacking an actual wide receiver too for the future. Jerry's going to pull the trigger on that. The whole entire, like, the whole entire team is going to pull the trigger on that. CeeDee Lamb's coming for a contract dispute or a contract negotiation as well for a massive contract. This could be a big part of it. Like, if you show loyalty and respect to CD, I mean, you're not guaranteeing yourself that you actually might save some money on his contract, but negotiations might be a little bit less hostile, a little bit more open, and CD Lamb is the cornerstone of this team. Uh, Keon Coleman is huge. I mean, bringing your cousin on, especially when he's complimentary, is honestly awesome. It's a great storyline. And people hate on Keon Coleman for no reason. It's just because he ran a 4640 and can't separate. If they actually had something besides a pea brain, they would have watched and saw that he's not known for his route running, and he never was. So when y'all were hyping him up, it is the same player as when you weren't. Stop trying to believe in, like, people just love to ride the trends. Just look with your own eyes. He's a great player, and he tested out in his gauntlet drill at 20 plus miles per hour. I think he was the fastest. So he runs fast, like plays fast, has great hands. Like he's actually really good after the catch as well for his size. Like, come on, guys, you got to You got to show more love to this guy um, right now. I think he is actually number 24 on my board. So makes sense. Ended up addressing the interior of the offensive line with Cooper Beebe, though. Need to get that guard spot filled as we kick Tyler Smith to tackle. Uh, Trey Benson, elite running back there at pick 87. He's obviously a top 40 pick for me. You got Kingsley Aguakun. I had to get some competition there at center, and he actually had a pretty solid uh, senior bowl week. A lot of people were talking about him. Jordan Whittington, getting another big body receiver there out of Texas. Kind of just getting good value there at 216. Then we got a freak athlete who tested out with that 12 foot, over 12 foot, I think it was like 12 2. Uh, broad jump and Tyler Owens might as well test out your luck on that on a freak athlete and then you actually get a starting uh, starting caliber corner there and Josh Wallace at pick 244 he was a pretty damn solid a really reliable starter there for Michigan as the season went on so shout out to him then we got the Eagles I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this I already know it and I love y'all just remember because I already know that y'all didn't watch the rest of the video <laughs> I'm calling y'all out um the, there's no linebackers available just keep that in mind. At pick 50, both of them were gone. Apart from Peyton Wilson, who I'm not going to take because of injury issues. And the reason that Kobe hasn't been able to play is because of injury issues. Maybe let's not do deja vu. So Leatu Latu is the first guy who comes off the board. Now, I've had some lengthy discussions about like what will bring the Eagles to the Super Bowl the fastest. Is it going to be an upgraded corner? Is it going to be an upgraded edge rusher or you know, an addition to edge rusher? Or is it going to be an addition to offensive line? Like, well, let's debate it, right? Now, I think that Leatu Latu might not be the day one wins above replacement best position. I think that might have been Kool-Aid McKinstry at pick 22, right? You need to have an elite corner in that group. You know, you're right now, we're, if the draft ends up falling the way this does, you're going to be kind of essentially hoping that you have a step up from Keely Ringo as well as Eli Ricks, as well as Isaiah Rogers. Luckily, there has been some pretty positive signs that you could be hoping for that. They are not absolute bums. Isaiah Rogers is a very talented corner. You have Keely Ringo, who has had some very solid games. And you also have Eli Ricks, who has shown it as well. Now you get Kamari Lassiter in round number two. The thing I love about Kamari is that he is everything Keely Ringo is not. He might not be the fastest guy in the world, Kamari, but he is super duper smart. And he's very, very talented in terms of being efficient with the steps. And he processes the field well. So it's almost as if they worked well together. Oh, they already did. So Kamari Laster would be a great addition there to pair back up with Keeley. Not just because it's Georgia, but because he also can play the slot right away. And that is super valuable for this team because I don't think there's a bona fide slot uh, Leotu Latu, forgot to continue mentioning earlier, this is a longer term plan. Uh, you're going to get someone who actually would probably be the most effective edge rusher out of this class on the first day. And you're getting somebody who will eventually replace Josh Sweat. So you're having somebody as a short run 
and long run pick right there. Xavier Worthy, wide receiver three needs to be fixed. Paris Campbell ain't scaring nobody. Xavier Worthy was there at pick 53. I thought it was a no-brainer. Cedric Gray, we need something for the linebacking core, so I'm going to be getting that with him, absolutely. Brand Coleman was brought in for a top 30 visit. Uh, no doubt in my mind that, you know, getting a versatile offensive tackle slash guard is going to be right up Stoutland's lane. Then we got Malik Mustafa, very versatile, very talented safety out of Wake Forest, getting basically best player available. And this team certainly loves the ability to continue taking tight ends when their tight ends are 28 years old. I decided not to do that with an earlier pick, but at pick 172, I went after one of my favorite tight ends in the draft, Jared Wiley. It will be pretty cool to see him and Grant Calcaterra go at each other for that TCU-SMU rivalry. Then at pick number 210, I actually ended up getting my buddy Brennan Jackson at Washington State. Great character guy, might end up being that like future BG, will be a practice squad guy in the short run. And then actually his talent might end up getting him on the roster in the long. New York Giants end up going Malik Neighbors to start out. That corner core is still a complete butt cheek, so we addressed it with my number 10 player overall and Andrew Phillips at 47. Then got Mason Smith at pick 70. I love the idea of putting Sexy Dexy in charge of coaching up Mason Smith, whose high ceiling plays are a first round pick worthy. And then we got Jalen Wright, home run hitting back out of Tennessee. Nice to have that energy there again. Jaheim Bell, kind of a flexible weapon, but going to be an understudy to Darren Waller there and Shaw Smith-Wade. Again, corner core is kind of butt cheeks, so got to be able to get something outside of your number one corner. Ended up getting Andrew Phillips and then Shaw Wade, or Shaw Smith-Wade to be able to deal with that. Niners started out with Nate Wiggins. Love that for him. I uh, ended up slipping to that spot. This team could certainly always be open for an upgrade at defensive back. Blake Fisher, talented right tackle there for you. Then we had to still address that defensive interior without uh, Javon Kinlog. Ended up getting McKinley Jackson, 320 pounds. Still very, very explosive. I'm a big fan of his. Bucky Irving slipped to 124. I thought it was a no-brainer. This team always takes a day two or early day three running back. I thought that was my opportunity to do so. Dwight McLaughlin was my next selection at 132. Just ended up continuing going BPA for this team. Drake Nugent, another BPA. Same thing with Satoa Laumea. Like, you're essentially getting best player available. And luckily, they're actually lining up with positions of need. Talia Tagovailoa actually, I think, would be a really good depth piece. He's had super high-level play for uh, Maryland. And, you know, he got denied his sixth year or seventh year uh, ability to stay in college. But I think that was because he was a guaranteed day three guy and wanted to compete to be a day two guy. Not going to happen, but he's actually a really solid backup because he fits very well into a Shanahan system. Then we got Frank Gore Jr. Of course, I had to do that. I mean, it's Frank Gore's kid. Had to select him there at 215. And then Dylan McMahon, just in depth interior offensive lineman piece out of NC State because we always get offensive line whenever possible. Now let's talk about the Seattle Seahawks. Troy Fautanu. Again, remember, no trades apart from that, you know, obvious Minnesota trade. Uh, Troy Fautanu was the selection out of Washington. Going to be a guarder in the short run, but also definitely could end up being that right tackle in the long. Ben Sinnott, this team loves their tight ends. And also after the catch, Ben Sinnott is ridiculous. Kobe Parkinson is now, if I'm not mistaken, on the Rams. So you definitely don't even have that. So you might as well get your replacement there in Ben Sinnott. Best player available, I ended up being pretty much for all the rest of the picks. Javon Bullard adding an extra safety slash slot. Not a bad idea at all. Kamal Hayden is literally like Richard Sherman, an absolute bully. And he's actually really smart in zone coverage as well. I think Kamal Hayden's just a little stiff. Kind of sounds a little similar to Tariq Woolen, but uh, you're getting him there at pick 118. Layden Robinson, he has tackle built, but he's going to be a developmental player. Maybe as Fautanu plays the guard year one, he could actually end up learning and becoming the guard after Fautanu becomes a tackle. Knock on wood, that doesn't happen, but you're actually going to get yourself some pretty good depth there. Then you got Grayson Murphy, uh, brother of Gabriel Murphy. You know, you're just getting a good edge rusher there for depth. And then Jalen Coker, a value wide receiver there out of Holy Cross. We had a really solid, uh, if I'm not mistaken, pretty sure his uh, 10 yard split was pretty damn solid, even though it was 40. Not so much. Now let's talk about the Rams. Uh, speaking of Colby Parkinson, you got Olu Fashanu at pick 19. Ended up slipping. A lot of people just don't like his hands. I, I think he's perfectly fine. You know, just. It could end up limiting how good he could be as a run blocker, but the Rams end up profiting nonetheless. They've invested a lot of money in the offensive line and continue to do so there. Michael Penix slipped to 52. Remember, no trades. And I thought, hey, you know, this is essentially Jimmy G. You just brought on Jimmy G. This is going to be a great idea. Uh, except technically Michael Penix is faster. But to be fair, we can shit on Jimmy G. I mean, this guy did tear his ACL sprinting for a first down and not a touchdown. 
Uh, then you got Leonard Taylor there. He's super high ceiling. I thought it was worth taking a shot on Kobe Turner, taking the lead and letting Leonard Taylor try to develop. Chris Abrams drain a little bit on the smaller side, but super versatile. Love it. Ray Davis, as well as Tyrone Tracy. I just wanted to get two a little bit more established backs that have that high level play. Tyrone T Tracy, if I'm not saying was a wide receiver for four years before coming a running back there for Purdue. JD Bertrand, depth linebacker piece. This team doesn't value linebacker that much. Then I ended up finally putting in Mevis there who had kicked his like 64 or 66 yard field goal. Love that for him. Uh, just getting a little bit more depth at kicker. Uh, then you got Ryan Watts, good DB, flexible out of Texas, Jalen Harrell. He's had his uh, upside as well moments out of Michigan. And then Josh Proctor, fan of taking him out of Ohio State. Could end up taking him higher, but we ball. Then we got Arizona Cardinals here going Marvin Harrison Jr. Already know that Makai is not going to like that, but you got to do what you got to do. But I focused really heavily on the defense and then pretty much went BPA only at the times I went offense. There's on Newton. Defense interior is a big issue. Got him as well as Brandon Dorless, but Brandon Dorless is super flexible in his role. End up getting Renardo Green to be our starting boundary corner. Um, Chris Braswell. You know, a BPA edge. You got to get help at edge too. Jalen Polk slipped to pick 90. Uh, you know, it's not, it wasn't something I purposely did. Just good players fall in the draft. I love Jalen Polk, but not nearly as much as some of these other receivers. Check out the receiver video. Mason McCormick, some people think is a lock in the top 60. I thought that, you know, hey, it's a good idea to take him if he's there at 104. DJ James slipped to 138 as well. Might as well continue getting some really good value at corner. Then you got Trevor Keegan, another solid uh, guard out of Michigan. Same thing with CJ Hansen, who tested well at a Holy Cross. And then got some extra edge help there in Nelson Caesar out of Houston. Oh, can't see Chiefs. So you got Jordan Morgan, flexible tackle in the short run. If there's any contract breakdowns with trying to get Trey Smith back, I think he could be an all-pro guard. So just saying, uh, you could or should tag and trade uh, Trey Smith if this ends up happening, if you end up having a good solution at left tackle. But Jordan Morgan play left tackle at an upgraded way than what you've already had played. Ruga Rojo's an absolute freak show. This dude's a beast. Super flexible as well in his role. I love that because he's going to be an edge and a defensive interior. And Jatavian Sanders, I mean, at pick 95, it's worth trying to get your future option at tight end. Malik Washington, people love him to death. I'm not a big Malik Washington guy. I got to say it. I'm like the hater on him. But at pick 131, it is totally realistic to think that he'd be in the equation after the catchability is great. Bo Braid, uh, safety out of Maryland. And you got to get some depth player there. And that's BPA all day. Same thing with Walter Rouse, who also obviously has, you know, come from the same school as what you just drafted in the last year in the third round in Wanya Morris. Then you got Tarheeb Steele, just a depth piece out of Maryland. You know, he's a solid player. I mean, he probably won't even make the team. But the Los Angeles Chargers are next. Again, this is part of that trade, the only trade in the mock draft. We ended up getting 11 and 23. Just did it straight up. Don't need to complicate it. Brock Bowers was the first selection. Oh my God, what? Yes, Brock Bowers was the selection for me. Um, when I thought about it a little bit more, you know, I didn't really like the fact that I, I had to reach essentially to get JC Latham. Yeah. So what y'all ended up like, you know, working with him at his pro day. I'm glad that y'all are at least doing your due diligence and start trying to make him a really good product. I mean, respect, but Brock Bowers is an elite weapon, a supremely elite weapon. And you got an extra first round pick out of it, but I still think you need help on the defensive line. Byron Murphy's going to help you out with that. You also need help at linebacker junior Colson. Has some familiarity with your defensive coordinator. In fact, they played together last year. Uh, I did not force Michigan to this team. I'm just going to be completely out, like upfront and honest with that. I did not force this. Uh, but Roman Wilson was there at 69. I thought that was best player available for what y'all need. You need something explosive? That's going to be great. He's going to add something right away. I thought Roger Rosengarten would be a great answer at right tackle. Honestly, I think he's going to be a bona fide starter. And you at least have Pipkins there who has started before. So you have good rotation if need be. Uh, Blake Corum adding that running back element as well as Keelan Robinson. I love that one-two punch that we got right there. And then got a couple other linebackers because, again, this linebacker core is absolute butt cheeks. Curtis Jacobs is actually a top 64 player on my board at the moment. So I ended up getting him at 140. Not too shabby, but also familiarity out of uh, the Big Ten. And then Jordan McGee tested very, very well there at a temple. And then Isaiah Williams did not test well, but had like a 200-yard game there for Illinois. Why not take a shot at 225?
Then we got the Vegas Raiders. Uh, we got their final two teams here. Vegas, I was like, you know what? Let's not force a quarterback pick, especially because there's no trades in this. Got Terry and Arnold to pick 13. You know, he's my number three player in the draft. I think just getting best player available is the best possible way to go. Then we got Bo Nix. Love that for y'all. Getting your signal caller as well at a very discounted rate. Dominic Pooney can play all positions of the offensive line. I like that for y'all as well. J. Luke McMillan. Essentially, is going to be your slot for the long run. I think that's also a very valuable asset to have a pick 112. Uh, people are going to be pissy that Audric SMA slipped. I just didn't value running back at all in these. I mean, he could have ended up going higher, sure. But as someone who is not an elite athlete, who is more of a contact balance back, you know, it don't hate on me for having running back slip when I think other valuable other positions are a little bit more valuable. They got Travis Glover, who I think is a very solid offensive lineman out of Georgia State. A.J. Barner, good blocking tight end out of Michigan. And then George Halani, really talented running back out of Boise State, who just got a little bit too much hate for, you know, I mean, he's not getting hate at all, but essentially doesn't get enough attention. And finally, we got the Denver Broncos. You were wondering where Quinion Mitchell was going to go. Ended up saying, screw the QB position. We're going Quinion Mitchell at pick 12. I really like Michael Pratt. Ended up actually having to having a chance to speak with him there at the Senior Bowl as well. I think that in the third round, this guy is absolutely comp uh, competent at being able to take some starting reps in the NFL. So he's going to be the starting signal caller at pick 76. That's worth it. Pick 121, we got Will Shipley out of Clemson. Really shifty back. I think this guy is absolute dynamite. And pair him up with Javante Williams. That's a one-two punch that can take a lot of the responsibility away from the QB. Makai Wingo, really just best player available. Same thing with Hunter Norzod. Both really talented interior offensive and defensive linemen, respectively, who just don't get enough attention. Anthony Gold, really valuable weapon now, especially with the kickoff rules. And then Sam Hartman, get a little bit more competition in there because Sam Hartman, really good game manager. Just a little bit weak in his arm. And then we got Tanner McLaughlin, just getting another really talented former receiver at tight end. So that's going to be it. Yeah, eight hours later. Technically nine because of the recording. But I love y'all to death. I hope y'all enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the far side. Peace.